So we've got a slideshow prepared today. We're going to show off some of the new functionality in Chimera 1.6. Uh, here's just a nice picture to get us started. We do have some water column features, uh, and that's always fun to look at. So the format for today, it's like we usually do with Chimera webinars. We'll be pretty light on slides, mostly demos, and uh, we're going to leave more time this time for questions and answers. Uh, Aveline did a great job last week with her webinar. There was a lot of engagement with people with questions, so uh, we're going to do that. So I learned a, a good lesson from her. Uh, she's in the background taking some of the questions as well as, well as a few others. Um, we'll pause frequently to answer them. If you look in your GoToMeeting widgets, you'll find there's a bunch of uh, handouts. There's a release notes as usual. There's 22 pages of PDF there that describes all the awesome, cool features we've got in this release. There's also two academic papers that you can find online that describe some of the math and concepts behind the Technical University of Delft SoundSpeed inversion algorithm that we have available in this release. Uh, and as always, if you want to download or evaluate Chimera, you can visit the, uh, the website and do that. Uh, also, at the end of the webinar, we'll do an all call out to see who's interested, and we can provide you with activation codes directly just to speed that process up. So before we get started, I've got uh, Abeline uh, helping me out here in the Netherlands. She hosted a webinar last week. She's a support engineer in the Zeist office. Also in the background is uh, Mo Doucette, the chief of software research and lead developer for Chimera, who's uh, been with Chimera since the first day and is still keeping it going strongly with the team. Uh, from the U.S. office, we've got Samantha Bruce, a technical sales engineer, and then Matt Wilson also, which is, who's relatively new to the team of QPS, who joined us last fall. Uh, he's marketing sales manager for the Americas. Uh, and they'll be in the background helping with questions uh, to see uh, if we can get you guys the answers you need in real time. So the highlights for this release, uh, those are just listed out in bullet form there. What we'll do today in this webinar is cover the stuff in green. If you're interested in the items below, please get in touch. They're pretty well documented in the release notes. I tried to do a good job of describing the major high points of each of those features there. So if you have some questions about those features that aren't highlighted in green, check the release notes. Uh, and if you still have questions, drop us an email. Get in touch. We're happy to walk you through that stuff. And if we can even arrange a little private one-on-one -on -one, uh, go-to meeting demos of some of that capability if you feel that would really improve your workflows. So what we'll do then is we'll just dive into these. So we've basically, I've divided into chapters. We'll touch on the sound speed correction filter, the ENC creation and editing, water column. Those are for the first three chapters. We'll take breaks in between. And then these last three features in green, we'll do those as a separate uh, altogether uh, demo. So first off, this is the stuff that's really, really interesting. And based on the, the questions we got in the webinar we did last week with Abilene, uh, everybody was really keen to find out more about this. This is a way to clean up all of the sound speed problems that have been bothering you for a lot of your career in uh, hydrography. And it, what it does is it, it takes a sets of pings and it looks at the neighboring lines and it uses the power of redundancy, the overlap between the survey lines to basically flatten it out. Uh, and it uses a best fit solution. It tries to minimize that mismatch in the areas and it only allows the data to curve, to curl and uncurl. So it won't accidentally introduce height steps and things like that. Uh, and it does it automatically. It does it over the whole spatial area, and it adapts to the changing oceanographic conditions quite nicely. The big, big advantage of this is that it's completely automated and objective. A lot of other the solutions that are out there, and even the, the previous solutions we've had with QPS, you need to scan through the data and manually adjust some fudge factors to make refraction problems go away. This is a, a click it and go kind of solution. The other nice thing, coming from my research background, is that this is physics-based. It reverse engineers the sound speed uh, water column model that will make the refraction problem go away. And it really honors the, fistic, the physics of acoustic ray bending. So having done a lot of research in that area, I'm quite pleased with this. It's rigorous, it's defensible, and actually it's really neat that it's accountable. The inversion process gives the results as, a, as a basically a byproduct. And you can look at that and vet it and adjust it. And, and if you don't like it, you can just turn it off and get back to the initial state. So what I'll do now, I've prepared a little video where we can show that off. And I just click play, and I'll just narrate over this. Uh, so we'll just make a quick product. What I've done is I've brought in a large data set. And as I prepare these videos, I hit pause on the recording as it was going through most of the processing, just to condense this down. Nobody wants to sit here and watch a computer work. So the data is coming in. This data set is from the R2Sonic multi-spectral backscatter challenge. We did a webinar about that several months ago. 
Uh, it's the same data set. And this is the data set that's also been in our press releases that you've seen. So here I brought in the files. I'm going to bring in an SBET. So that's the post process GPS height. And I add the SBET system to my vessel configuration file. I click OK. And I made a little bit of a goof up here in the video. I forgot to say, please bring in the position and the height. So there, it reminded me. I click OK. And you see on the left, it's importing the SBET. That's a couple of gigabytes in that file. It takes a minute. So we pause it, and then it comes back to life. Uh, OK, and then we get to the uh, sonar files, and it's an SBET. We want to reference that to uh, title datum. So we know that the offset is minus 22.42. So I'm just walking through the, the basic steps to get this data set ready to go. And it's going to process the data. You see on the left that the, the, the cogs are turning for the files, and the process bathymetry task is backgrounded. So I hit pause. There we go. We're ready to make a surface. And there's a lot of depth variability here, so we'll just do two meters to make sure we get good coverage and no holidays. I'll turn off the aspect for visibility just to clean that up. And then there's my surface. So this is the same surface that we would have used for the backscatter uh, webinar we did a few months ago. And you'll notice that there's a lot of spikes in here. Uh, it was just a lot of uh, interesting sonar settings in Quincy when it was recorded that uh, I think we could have cleaned that up a little bit in real time. Um, so what we can do here is just clean that up real quick. We'll do a quick, uh, very strong spline. This is a new change to the filter toolbar. The buttons are a little more simplified. We want to apply that to the whole area. So you see the spline is running as a background task. We'll just fast forward in there and let that update. And the grid should clean up quite a bit. So again, we're just staging the data to get to the point where the noise is all gone, and the last problem is the refraction. You can see that the spline filter uh, didn't quite like getting some of the spikes, so there's a little bit of a residual cleanup to do. You can do that with the slice editor. So I did an area selection there. And when I use the slice editor, I like to make the dots nice and big so I can see where the outliers are. And it's very, very obvious. I don't have to sit there and squint. Uh, and then I do the same here. So I'm obviously not going to make you watch me clean this whole data set. Uh, there's a couple to make the point. Of, this is part of the staging process for this data. How's the audio and video coming through, Abelene? Just to do a quick check. All good, JB. Okay. Please go good. ahead. Okay, so save. So what I did here is I paused it when I was preparing this, and I went ahead and cleaned the rest of this, the data set. It took me a couple minutes. Okay, so now we've got a dynamic surface, and you can see that there's some interesting artifacts in the northern corner of it. And the best way to see refraction artifacts is to color by the standard deviation. And then Duncan showed me a great trick a while ago. Use the midwater color map. It's nice and calm blue for low values, and then it's an angry red for high values. And I stretch it to zero to point to zero point five meters, and you can see that there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in the northern corner. Those are all refraction artifacts, and anybody who's dealt with that would be used to the seeing this. So we can see those actual artifacts, and this is the raw data. If you requested it from R2Sonic, this is the state that it would come from. So there is an artifact in that data set. So let's see if we can clean that. If I look in the slice editor, you can see the survey lines in the northern tip have a refraction problem, but the ones in the southern end don't have as much. And what's nice with this, with the slice editor, of course, you can just kind of save this to an image real quick. So that little view portal, just save an image. We'll call this before. And then uh, we'll get out of the slice editor. And what I'm going to do is this is a new right-click mode in the scene, which a lot of people have asked for. I want to create a line object from that box that I drew. I want to be able to save that selection so that I can use it again later. I want to come back to the exact same spot in the exact same area. And you'll see that shows up in the SD objects part in the project layers on the right-hand side. So if I turn my lines on, select them, and click the dynamic surface, this is how you run the tool. Oh, wait. Wait, I forgot. It's nice to get a before snapshot of your dynamic surface. Choose a standard deviation color by and the mean depth layer. I give it the name before. So this way, we have a record of what it looked like before we ran the filter. And that's stored there in the static surface section of the project layers widget. 
and you can stretch the color map there to be the same as what we had in the dynamic surface. Okay, so that's tucked away for when we want to look at it later. Now we'll run the tool. It's as simple as this, manual processing, and you click TU Delft sound speed inversion, and you click OK. And we've set the defaults up to be but what, probably what most people would want. Uh, the manual describes what those options are. And when you run it, it's running an inversion process and then it re-ray traces. So I did a fast forward in my video prep and you'll see that that big angry red area is gonna turn to a nice calm blue. All those refraction artifacts, gone. So what you can do now is that selection that we saved before, you can right click on this and say, use this line as a selection now. So that polygon lights up in the scene. You can see it switch to a polygon uh, mode. And also in the right click venue, you can edit and say, launch the slice editor. This is a new capability. It's in that right click context. And you see the exact same set of soundings I was looking at before. And then what we can also do is go to the context menu in the slice editor Save that as an image. We'll call this after. And we've got a little gut check, just a couple of little pictures called before and after that show us how good of a job that did. And then you can do the same trick we did before with the dynamic surface. We'll create a snapshot as a static surface. I want the entire surface. I'll call it after. And again, the mean layer, this, and then the standard deviation color by, and I click OK. And this extracts that layer from the dynamic surface, and it, it basically is taking a picture of it, and it's not going to change if we do more processing. And we'll just make this so that the color maps have the same range, one meter. And then we'll use my favorite uh, tool in Chimera, which is flicker mode. That's the tilde key on your keyboard, and you can flick between the two and pan around. And you see the standard deviation is going down pretty much everywhere, especially in the areas where there was a refraction problem. But where there wasn't one before, there's not so much. And you see in the lumpy, bumpy area where there's a lot of rocks and, and geomorphology, the filter is handling that nice there. There's some refraction problems going on. You don't see the standard deviation going down around the, the rocks and, and the shapes. So it's pretty good at doing the match and only allowing for a refraction correction, and that's it. And that's it for this video. And then just because I, I took the trouble of preparing a before and after picture, let's put them side by side. And this is what you see. So if you saw our news item from a few months ago, this is what we had shown there too. So that's the slicer at the top showing the refraction problem. And below, it's all mopped up for you uh, nice and easy. So that's the end of that little part of the demo. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll see if Abelene has some questions about this particular material to uh, that we can talk about a bit. Yes, JB, there were two questions coming in. The first question was if it's uh, if the tool only works uh, for the symmetry. Uh, I'm not sure what the alternate would be. Uh, also for backscatter. Oh, uh, the, the refraction tool wouldn't do anything to backscatter. If you had backscatter that had refraction positioning problems and then you took this data into FMGT, it would fix the, the better georeferencing would be carried along with that. Uh, I'm not sure I answered the question. Maybe, maybe you can get more clarification, and then we can uh, we can answer that maybe at a later time. Yeah, I'll try and get some more clarification on it then. That's fine. The other question is: Is the functional functionality available in Chimera Clean? It isn't with this release, but the uh, the developer who built this, his name is Weston Renaud. Uh, He's uh, in our Zeist office, but he spent uh, a lot of time in Fredericton building Chimera. He spent the last couple of weeks figuring out how to bring this capability to Chimera clean. Uh, and he's got that pretty much done, and we hope to release that for OI. We're in the testing phases for that. And it works right now. It'll work for Chimera clean for QPDs that come from Quincy only. Uh, we're also investigating, can we get this to work for generic point file formats? But that's an ongoing research project. Okay, is, is there a time for uh, some other question or would you like to continue? Sure, well, let's take one and then we'll, I wanna, wanna make sure we leave some room for the other, uh, the other uh, demos. Okay, then the last question on this uh, subject. Does the algorithm generate an error report that can be applied in CPU calculations? Uh, there isn't an error report uh, and it doesn't feed into the TPU calculation. So the TPU that you would have computed before, which was model-based, 
uh, is not affected by this at all. And that, that's an interesting research topic, actually. I don't think we have good models that capture TPU influences from uh, sound speed problems. The models are a little bit uh, a little bit unsophisticated in that regard, to the best of my knowledge. And that's in general across the community. Okay. Okay. Thanks, JB. I think you can uh, proceed with uh, with your other uh, demonstrations. Then, thanks. Okay. Abelene, before I forget, did you remember to record this? Yes, I did. Okay. Good. Thank you. Because <laughs> I would have forgotten. Okay, so let's get to chapter two. This is also a new add-on in Chimera 1.6, ENC, so electronic nautical charts. You can create and edit S57 features in Chimera. And this is meant for light work here. It's not a full-blown ENC production engine. We have software for that with Cardo and Composer. This is meant to get you ENC work that you need to do when you're very close to the bathymetry, or you're looking at water column it, imagery, for example, and uh, and soundings themselves. Uh, you can import an EMC for feature updating. This is a workflow that's used in North America when doing charting work for NOAA. Uh, that's something that we'll cover in a later webinar. And Matt Wilson, who's joining us today in the background, has agreed to host that. So I'm not going to go into great detail on that. What I'm just going to focus on is some of the high points of this. Uh, what's really neat with building Chimera is that uh, we started this and there was a lot of great technology within the company already to do things. So this came together very, very quickly. We have a great Q, uh, ENC rendering engine at our disposal, and that's used in Quincy and Processing Manager, Castor and Cardo. It delivers uh, navigation-worthy ENCs so that you can drive off. And we've got that built inside the Chimera. This lets you have a what you see is what you get type of experience when you're working with ENC features. When you make them in Chimera, we store them in a QNC file. That's our internal ENC format. It's uh, optimized for streaming off the disk, whereas the traditional ENC interchange formats aren't. Uh, what, what you can do when you're done, though, is you can export that file as an ENC for delivery to whoever needs it. And that's a, a, a full ENC file that anybody who can read it, an official ENC would be able to read one of ours. So the big points to take away from this is that there's a big productivity increase over what people are, are doing now. This is laser targeted at the North American charting market. There's a lot of people doing work for NOAA and they have to do feature management. And what we've done is we've built it so that you can pick features from soundings and from the grid. And when you pick point features, it pulls out the sounding value from the point itself or from the grid. And then the other really, really neat thing is it's just like regular Chimera Magic. If you had to make a change to your data, let's say you forgot to bring in your tide or you brought the wrong tide in, you can bring that in and then of course all your soundings update and your grids update, but all of the ENC point features that you pulled from the data will also update. And we think that's really, really cool. We're really excited to get that in the hands of people. Uh, also looking at the North American ENC workflows, we've embedded the no extended attributes. What I've got on the lower right is just a, a notepad view of what that looks like. It's an XML file. It's a custom catalog that lets you add your own attributes and, uh, and that kind of stuff to an ENC object. So you can have people mark up things and add comments and that sort of thing and manage uh, the review uh, and creation and deletion of features a little bit. You can also create your own custom schema. And then we've made our own that allows us to do that magic where we maintain a linkage between the S57 features and the soundings and grids. So that those are the high points. What I'm gonna do is jump right to another video where I show this off. So again, I've, I've prepared this beforehand. I fast forward a little bit in a few spots to speed things up and I'll just narrate over the video. So I'll add a file here. And this is a, a file that you've seen in many, many of our webinars previously. It's something off the uh, west coast of Canada. It's the wreck of the GB Church in the Strait of Georgia between uh, Vancouver Island and Vancouver. So you've seen this in our Khmer 1.4 webinar uh, and probably a few other webinars too. So what I'm going to do is I've got a dynamic surface. I'm going to change the opacity to about 25% so that I can see the chart behind it or on top of it. And then I'm pointing out the new ENC editor doc widget that we've got here. So this is new. If you have the ENC add-on, you'll have this available. And I can create a point. So let's zoom in here. I see a little rock. I'm going to turn off the background chart. And I'm going to click on that rock. And it says, hey, would you like to make your own new ENC layer now? I say, yes. 
I give it a, a name, my new features. And then from that point, it says, okay, what kind of ENC object is that? That's an underwater rock. Uh, here's some attributes that I need to fill out. Uh, it's always underwater. I can add some attributes and you'll notice that the NOAA ones are there, remarks, recommendations. If those are the ones that you need to pay attention to, you can do that. So I can type in a remark. This is pretty deep. I don't think this should go on the chart, but, but it's just for a demo. Recommendation. I have no recommendations. Oh, before I click OK, let's point out the magic. 18.76, the val sound, this, the value of the sounding itself got pulled from the grid. And you'll see that this is populated in the ENC editor doc. That's right there. And it's also drawn with the kernel, the ENC rendering engine. It's drawn right there and it's drawn separately from the background charts. You can turn the background charts on and off at any point and have that context immediately if you like. So let's look at making ENC objects from the swath editor and swath editor is the portal to the water column data. And you can see that we get some nice imaging on the rec. This is a new feature here. You can stack up and see a side view of the entire line with this release before you could just see the current ping buffer, which only showed hundred pings or so. So if I zoom in there and I click on the mast area, the explore mode, that will jump my swath editor to that point. And you'll see in the fan view on the left that the mast is lit up. And I can use the A and the D key to march my swaths back and forth. You'll see that updating in the scene, the yellow line, and you'll see it updating in the fan view. And I, saw, I see the top of the mast there. there ha we happen to know that there's a, a line extending off the top of that mast to a surface buoy because it's quite shallow. And I choose a uh, rec here as the object. I get the attributes. Uh, it's a dangerous rec. There's the value of the sounding. Uh, and let's make a remark. I do maybe want to chart this. I'll make a remark that the line from the mast to the surface buoy is there. And then my recommendation. This is standard NOAA workflows. Please update the chart with this value. And then Matt can correct me if I'm wrong. He's actually done this for a living, whereas I've only seen people do it. So you see the magenta dot is there. And you'll see this shows up in the ENC editor doc. There's the value of the sounding, and there's my remarks and the recommendations there. So it's not just from the water column that you can create ENC features. Let's jump to the, uh, the aft end of the rec. So I left click explore, and I jump there. And let's just look at the, the soundings in the swath editor itself. And you'll notice that there's a new button there. I can make an ENC object from a sounding in here. And I get the same dialogue, what kind of object is it? And I set the attributes that like it. It persists the things that you typed last. So if you wanted to get a workflow where you looked at all of the recs and you had the same remarks, you could leave that there. And you see that that's, boom, it's popped into the ENC editor doc. There's that sounding, and that's from the swath editor. Uh, and when you leave from picking in the water column, it actually needs to make that a proper sounding. So that's the traditional workflow we've had from since 1.4. You'll see that the, the map view is updating with those soundings that I'm putting on there. So the slice editor, let's just do a tour of the editors here. If you jump into the slice editor and grab a slice over the whole ship, you get all the soundings pulled in the lower view. And what I'll do just for demonstration, there's that same button. I can make an ENC point object from a sounding that I collect and then the value of the soundings pulled in and auto-populated. I can update the various uh, attributes that I care about. And here I might want to make a different remark. I have no remark. Or maybe I want to point out that this is the position of the center of the, the vessel in case the person that wants to do the charting wants to put that position instead. And again, we can do the exact same thing with the 3D editor. So I click the 3D editor button. You'll see that the previously identified soundings, uh, ENC objects are drawn as blue uh, prisms, I guess you could call those. And I've got the same button here, the ENC creation object button. There's the value of the sounding. There's the center of the rec. I'm going to update my remark. This is a second point on there. I click OK. And now I leave the 3D editor, and I come back to my ENC editor doc, and I've got all of those five soundings that I've created from either a grid or from soundings themselves pulled there. So I can quickly scan through data and get all of the soundings and I trust the soundings get 
there's a correct sounding. There's no human fat finger typing error. So what I do here is I'm just running a snipping tool. I'm going to copy just that little bit of the window here for the sake of making a point in the next step of this demo, which is I'm going to bring in a tide file. We'll see what happens. So I'll navigate to where that file is on disk. There it is. And the tide recognizes that I've brought that formatted in before I give my station a name. I click OK. The tide gets imported. You'll notice that the, the bathymetry file, it's, it's marked as needing reprocessing. You get prompted to reprocess it. You say OK. And then let's just bring up that screenshot of the soundings from before. And you can see that they've all been adjusted now. So those are hooked up in the same way that the dynamic surface is hooked up to your soundings. If you change the soundings at all in depth or position, that will be updated in the ENC features. So if uh, let's wrap this up then, I can now export this as a, as a triple zero file to give to the recipient or whoever's taking the data from me. And that's it. There's a whole lot more you can do with this. This new functionality deserves a webinar all on its own and Matt's uh, kindly agreed to go through that uh, sometime in the next few weeks or maybe even month. Uh, so we'll, we'll leave it to that and uh, we'll maybe take a break here for any questions about ENC, the new ENC plus add-on. Abelene, anything coming in? Uh, yeah, Debbie, there's a question. Um, the question is, how does Chimera know what coordinate to use in the ENC when the mouse cursor is moved off of the scene to the side panel to click the ENC object button? In the scene, uh, actually, what happens uh, if I, I actually, I think, can you see my mouse moving around in here? Yeah. Okay, this button here is how you go into object selection mode. When you click that, the second that you click in the scene, that's the coordinate that's pulled out. I, I, I think that answers the question. If not, maybe we can get a clarification on the question. And anytime you pick it in any of the editors, when you go into selection mode, so this same button shows up in the swath editor, the water column viewer, the slice and 3D editor. When you click on that, your mouse cursor mode goes into a, a mode where the next click that you do, it will grab the X, Y, and Z from that. I, I think that answers the question. If not, maybe the uh, the attendee can clarify. I will, we'll try. Yeah, the asker has just said it's clear, I missed it. And he says okay. it's clear. Okay, good, yeah. good. All right. Thank you. No more questions. All right, cool. So let's go to the next chapter, which is the water column. What's new? So water column is stuff we had when we first released Chimera. You could look at the water column data, but that was about it. In Chimera 1.4, which we released, I think, maybe a year and a half ago, you could uh, create points in there in the same way that you could in FM Midwater. Uh, and you can extract objects and, and seeps and shipwrecks and stuff like that. And they would all be rigorously ray traced and georeferenced using the same uh, georeferencing engine that Chimera uses for regular soundings that we got from Quincy. All of that's powered by the Quincy engine. Uh, so what's new in this release? So there's a lot of longstanding functionalities. You can build a side stack view for the entire survey line. So that's the same as FM Midwater. So if I move my mouse around a little bit here, this side view, you can now see the entire survey line. Before you just saw the few hundred pings that you had loaded up in the swath editor buffer. And that was a, an immediate request from people that had used FM Midwater. You can use uh, range stacking and depth stacking. I won't get into details with that, but now the, these two options are consistent as what you can do in FM Midwater. The really, really neat thing now that uh, we got from working with our, our colleagues at Fugro who do uh, seep hunting for oil and gas exploration is they wanted to see seeps and they wanted to, with as little work possible, get the base of the seep position and have it fully georeferenced with, with a full refraction correction. So that's what we've built with this release. Uh, we talked to them and we realized, oh, you need to know that within seconds of seeing it so you can pass it to the bridge so you can navigate to that point and put an ROV down or, or take a core sample at that exact location. So we really streamlined that workflow for them. There's a couple of more visibility controls and you'll see that in the video I've got. And then what really is cool is that you can do a snapshot of the full side stack view into the scene. And that's what I've done here in this image. This is the full survey line. You can click on the camera button here to take a snapshot, put it up into the scene. It drops it right in. So you can have that for remembering or for guiding you as you look through your data and try and do interpretation. 
So I'll jump to a little video showing off the instant georeferencing. So if I was a Fugro seep hunter, this is how we would recommend that you use this new capability. So again, it's a pre-prepared video. I'll just narrate over it. This data set was kindly provided by uh, Garrett Mitchell at Fugro. Uh, he gave this a little while. So we got permission to use this and uh, we just want to acknowledge that the, they gave us this data. It's a good data set. So we've got the data coming in. You can see the ENCs in the background until you're in the Gulf of Mexico. If you zoom out a little bit, you can see there's some oil and gas infrastructure marked up on that chart. So if we go into the swath editor mode, click on one of those lines. And we'll just tip it into 3D for a second so we can see what's going on. And I can scan through the file and look at a single fan view at a time. And you can see there's some seeps there. But this isn't something you'd want to do uh, if you were doing this all day long. So this is uh, where you come in with a new side view. So you can see the entire line and it stacks it up. This is the same process that's done with FM. It works the exact same math and the same routines. And you can see that there's some seeps there in the middle. So what I can do, as I showed before with the water column in the rec, you can left click in there when you're in explore mode and you can seek to that position. And what's really neat is I can hide the fan view now. If this is the view that I really care about, I can hide that and I click the snapshot and boom, that just drops right up into the scene. Now what's neat is if you're a seep hunter, I've got the full bathymetric context. I can spin around, I see where the seeps are likely to be. Of course, they're collapsed from the fan down into a single curtain view. What I can also do is open up the ping buffer on the swath editor and color code the points by intensity. And you get some context on where the high backscatter areas are, which is pretty important if you want to figure out if something's really a seep or what kind of seep it is. So I can left click in here and jump to that position. I can left click up in the scene also because I'm in the swath editor mode and that will seek me to that position also. So what I would recommend then is we turn the fan on. If you want to get to the base of seeps, you can work with the tiny little side view or you can have the scene view. So if I left click there, I reposition my swath editor there and the fan view updates. And so now I want to work in the fan. So I'm going to hide the, uh, the side view. I want all of that screen real estate to be on the fan. And now I can use the A and the D key to update which ping I'm looking at. If you look up in the scene, you'll see the yellow line marching along, moving back and forth. So you have some spatial context of which fan you're looking at and where. And you can see there's a few seeps that appear there. So if we could zoom in at the bottom, if you're ultimately interested in where is that coming out of the seafloor, you can zoom in and still use the A and the D key to bounce back and forth. You can turn on the soundings view to see where did the uh, seafloor think, sorry, the multi think the seafloor is. I can go into geopic mode. That's the button I just clicked there. That's the new button in the toolbar. And if I think that's the base of the seep, I geopic there. So it's the same way you would have done it in FM Midwater. It shows up in the scene as that white dot. So that's instantly georeferenced and ray traced and corrected. So you know, oh, interesting. That comes from that high backscatter area. That makes sense to me. And the geopic table that you're used to seeing in FM Midwater and in Flare Mouse is now in Chimera. And you've got the full Eastings and Northings or latitude, longitude position. Those are rigorously georeferenced in the same way we ray trace all the soundings, and the patch test correctors, and all that stuff. So if you want to get that little text file off to the ROV crew, you can export that and send that down to them. And they know where to, to navigate to, for example, or you send it up to the bridge to get them in the rough area. If you just have a look in Notepad, you can see what's in that file. So you've got the position, the depth, uh, the backscatter value, and the time. And if you had had any comments at all in the label field, you would get that there too. So if we go back to uh, how do we do this over and over? for a whole survey worth. You can click on a line and you get your view set up to be just the side view. You don't, if you want to kind of get yourself ready to navigate through all the data, what we're recommending is you get the side view and you drop a snapshot, you jump to the next line, you stack it and you get the side view and then you get the snapshot from that as well. You drop that into the scene. 
And then you've got that full spatial context of what's going on. Where am I? Where am I relative to my other survey lines? Where's the interesting bathymetry that might explain these seeps? And that sort of stuff. You can make much better decisions there. You can control the visibility of those, of course. You can also change the opacity if you want to be able to see through those. And if you didn't like the default view, if you wanted to change the color map, uh, you can do that before you click the snapshot button in the water column widget. So you can collect all of these and then basically switch into, okay, now that I have all these in the scene, let's scan through them in the swath editor mode and pick the bottoms of the seeps uh, using the, the method I just shown in the first uh, few minutes of this video. And that's it for that part. So maybe we'll take a, a couple of minutes to answer any questions about the new water column capability. JB, so far there are no questions about the, the water column capability. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Well, if they come up later, I'm happy to take them later. Let's proceed then. Uh, so what I've do, done now is the, the other highlights, I've, I've just grouped them into a miscellaneous new features grouping here. The geopicking that I showed with the, uh, the seep uh, finding is also available in the swath editor the, and all of the other editors, and you also can pick it from the grid. So I'll show that in the next video. For FM Hydro users, so people coming from Flated Mouse that had the checked area flag, uh, we had initially had that in the first release of Chimera, but realized there were some problems with updating and maintaining it. Uh, when you reprocess surfaces. Uh, so we've fixed that and brought that back out. And we've worked with a few of our colleagues uh, to get that working well for them. Uh, we've added a new feature uh, in that there's a filter, a custom filter that you can set flags. So you can select an area on the surface and say, please set a suspect flag or a plotted flag and that kind of stuff. And that uh, streamlines some of the FM Hydro workflows from Flatter Mouse that people might be used to. There's another mode too that mimics uh, what we had with uh, cloud for cloud users that would uh, be instantly filtering the surface. Uh, you can select polygons and have it immediately reject, reject or accept or do any kind of filter in that area. And you don't need to visit an editor to do that. And then we also tweaked the spline filter, which uh, I showed off with the refraction uh, example a few minutes ago. You can specify the spline filter to either only filter soundings above the surface or below it or above and below. The previous uh, incarnations of the spline filter always removed outliers that were above and below the, or below the surface. So we've built this for hydrographic users who are uh, doing charting work who might be a little nervous about applying splines and removing shoal soundings but are quite comfortable having it reject deep outliers. So that's an interesting uh, bit of granularity to an existing very, very powerful filter that's pretty neat. So this next little video, it's gonna capture all of those. And I'll, again, I'll narrate over that. So we'll start off with the geopicking. So there's the geopicking table that I pointed out. In the main toolbar, I can go to this mode and I can select directly on the grid. A little red dot shows up and the X, Y, Z position is there. I can go to geographic mode if I like. Uh, if there's a backscatter value from sounding, it'll pull that in. If I want to give it a, layer, a label, I can do that, give it a comment. This is something that was available in Flattermouse, or, or sorry, still available in Flattermouse. Uh, a similar, very similar capability existed in Cloud that you can make annotations. So what we've done above and beyond what Cloud did is that I can go to soundings in any of the editors. Let's just color code these soundings by depth. And this is just for example. I'm going to pick random soundings. If I click on that, so that sounding, it's X, Y, Z position gets pulled in there. And I can add a label here. I pick this from the swath editor. So I can go through my data sets and pick points of interest for whatever reason. Maybe I'm, I'm trying to mark up bad data. Maybe I'm trying to do some quick interpretation. Uh, maybe I'm trying to highlight areas where there's problematic uh, processing. So it's just a general purpose tool. It, uh, it serves the geopicking seed uh, punters very well, but it's also general purpose. So here I'm in the slice editor. The same new button is there. I can click a sounding. It gets drawn in that particular mode. Oh, not the ENC editor doc, the geopicking, and it's there. I can come in and add a label. And then I can switch to the 3D editor. I just toggle over to that. And then the same button shows up there in the cursor mode. I click a sounding. 
and I leave the editor. And that shows up in my GeoPic table. And I'm just going to add a comment here. I'm just making, making some points here that I can do that. What you can also do is, um, as you click on any of those items in the table, those, those uh, fields on the right-hand side of that dock will update. And I can jump to that point to see what that is. So I can basically mark up little areas that I want to come back to. What you can also do from here is export this as a text file. There's an export button in the lower right. Uh, you can also turn these into an SD file, which drops it into the scene. You'll have much better control over how you can draw those items. So I'll switch to the checked area uh, functionality, which is something that Flatermouse users are used to. So I'm going to color this particular dynamic surface by standard deviation. And I'll stretch the color map so it highlights the areas where there's problems. And so the checked area mode, uh, what you can do is highlight the surface by the checked flag. And we haven't checked anything, so Control K is, is a shortcut that allows you to check that area. You, you, you're marking it manually as, as checked. Whatever that means to you is up to you. Also through the right click menu, which is new, you can do it that way too. So you can march along and let's say you're reviewing the data and you want to say that I've checked it, it looks okay. You can do that. You can also clear it, say I've unchecked it for whatever reason. And that highlight by flag lets you mark up the surface that way, uh, but still be able to see what you're working with. So you've got depths color coded by standard deviation. So we'll jump to the new uh, set, set flag filter. So set suspect flag, I'm gonna create a custom filter. If I scroll down near the bottom here, there's a new custom filter called set flags. And here I'm gonna say set, set, set suspect flag to yes. Click okay. And now I've created a new custom filter that anything I do, I will set the, the suspect flag. So I'm gonna change the dynamic surface to color code by suspect flag. And I'm, I'm going to use the new instant surface filter toolbar. So with that new filter there, and it's going to warn me. When you do this filter, it's going to happen right away. Uh, and it switches your mode to polygon select. And now when I draw and I finish, it sets the suspect flag and it marks up the surface like that. So that's another way that you can differentiate between a checked area or a suspect area and the instant uh, application filter toolbar mode that we've added in this release is uh, a nice way to do that. You're just working off the surface and you're marking it up. And that's stored within the dynamic surface itself. And also in the uh, soundings, uh, the suspect flag is set on the soundings. So let's show the new granular spline filter. We'll call it Splunder, it's a funny name. We're gonna spline under the surface. So those are the, all of the filters that you can build from. So let's just expand that. And we want to use a preset spline filter. So this existed with Chimera since uh, quite, a, quite a while. There's a new way to toggle how you reject. And in this case, if I'm a nervous cartographer, I only want to reject below the surface. I'll leave all the shoal soundings because I want to make a human decision if I have a shoal to, to worry about or if it's just a bad sounding. So if we select an area and then jump into the slice editor mode, we can get a bit of a preview on what this filter is going to act like. So let's hunt around the surface and find a spot where there's some, some outliers below the surface. There's some. And I can click the filter button and it runs on that area. And you see all the, the outliers above the surface are still there. I can be a nervous cartographer and be happy with that. But I've thrown away the gunk that's below the surface. No one's going to run aground on a hole. Uh, that's not what I'm worried about. I'm worried about that stuff. So I can save that and then march around the surface and then see if there's some other areas where there's some deep spikes. And there's some, I'm happy to filter those, but keep the shallow spikes. So this is just more granularity, more control over how the spline filter works. The default is still above and below. And what we've done is we've changed the toolbar a little bit to be a little cleaner. The buttons are different. Now I can say run this filter profile everywhere on the surface. And that'll happen. You see it's running in the background. It's got to pass through all of those 15 QPDs. We'll just fast forward there. The dynamic surface updates. So I've just removed all of the deep spikes from the surface, but I've left the shallow spikes because maybe that's something that I want to worry about with a different tool or I want to review manually. And so to round this out, uh, let's say I want to clear my suspect flags. 
we had a, we've had a filter for quite a while where you can clear flags. So I'll show how that works. I want to clear the suspect flag here. Click OK. I'm not, now I have a new custom filter called clear suspect flag. I'm going to use the surface instant filtering mode. I get warned again that this is going to apply immediately. And now I, let's say I've reviewed that. I, I don't think it's suspect anymore. I can clear that flag. The highlight goes away in the dynamic surface and then the QPD flags are updated with that particular change. So you can quickly apply the suspect flag and unapply it. And this is just a nice way to work if you want to mark up areas that are suspect and use that differently than you do with the checked flag. So that's it for that particular chunk. Is there, uh, are there any questions, uh, Abelene, about this? Yeah, there are a couple of questions coming in, JB. Right. Um, the first question, yeah, and the first question is if you can export the set checked areas to an SD file. Uh, export the suspect areas? Uh, the set checked, so the, the ones you marked. Areas. Checked I, areas. I don't think so. Uh, no, that's a really, that's a neat, neat uh, feature request though. If you can just jot a note about that in the chat log, that's something that I'd like to throw in the feedback project and we get get some people uh, voting on that. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Um, no, not about the, um, the, the latest subject you were covering, but there are some new questions on the... Um, uh, what a column functionality came in. Shall we do that after the? Well, let's, let's, take, one, let's take one for now and uh, give my brain a break uh, from, from oh, narrating. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, there is, there was a question, um, the stacking that you did, was it using range or that stacking? That was the range stacking. And the nice thing about range stacking is you don't need to worry about the side lobe interference at all. That's the way that Midwater has always worked with FM Midwater, uh, we added the depth stacking capability to give you at least a way to view it in a geometrically honest way. The range stacking has the same kinds of geometric distortions that side scan does, like layover, uh, for example. So but the, the range stacking is really, really good for hunting seeps. Uh, if you're trying to look at uh, infrastructure in the seabed, like a wreck or an oil rig, you would likely want to use a, a depth stacking mode. Okay, and I think there is another interesting one that's regarding the the water column also. How can I extract the XYZ and amplitude of the water column reflections and export to a file for importing it into Flader Mouse, for example? Uh, if it's just extracting the point, like the seat base, we covered that in the webinar. So we'll post this on YouTube, and I think that user can go back and look at that. If it's about getting a whole bunch of points out at the same time, that was functionality we released with Chimera 1.4, and that's covered in that webinar also. So maybe we can uh, send that uh, attendee the links to those to that, that webinar. And if they can't find the answer to that, then we can help them figure that out. It's, 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 I think it's quite well covered there. But in a very, very short summary, you can extract the points and we maintain the backscatter value and the XYZ position those get turned into soundings, which you can then isolate and extract as an SD file uh, or as a text file. So that capability is there, but I'm, I won't dive into that right now. That's covered in the, the older webinars. Yeah, okay. Okay, I think you can uh, continue, JB. Thanks. Okay, cool. So what we'll do now is we're going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, we wanted to talk about something we call the feedback project, and this covers all of the feature requests and suggestions we get from clients. And you know, it's it's been a few years since QPS and IVS became one company, and it took us a while to figure out how to merge our support systems and merge our product management uh, procedures. And we're finally getting a lot of that really figured out. And the feedback project is a really, really nice outcome of that in that we found a way that works for both of the historic teams to deal with the volumes of feedback and suggestions we get. And this is largely following what, what a lot of large uh, software companies also do is you take that and you put it into an open and transparent voting system so people can see what other users are asking for. You can comment on it, you can vote on it. And this allows you to help us to help you. Instead of us getting suggestions and then they go into a system 
and you have no idea what happens to them and nor does anyone else, we want to go for complete transparency. So we're, we're going to move all this stuff here. And we've done this a lot with a, a big, big backlog of Quincy feedback in the last uh, maybe 18 months. We've migrated that. And we started doing that as well with Chimera. What do, how do you get to the feedback project? So let's say you want to make a feature request in JIRA. Uh, you can go log into JIRA, our bug tracking system. And then if you click on the top left, you'll get uh, this menu here. And you can come to one of these here. So what I've done is the feedback for Chimera is here. And this brings you to this set of widgets. And you can what I'll do is I'll follow this link. And this will bring me to a browser. Hopefully, this doesn't uh, gum up the webinar. Can, is that coming through, Abilene, OK? Yes, that's coming in through OK, JB. OK, so what you're going to see, let's say you want to request something in the Slice Editor, and you come here. Uh, these are all of the requests that come in, and they're ordered by the, the date of entry. Here are the same requests ordered by the number of votes. So this FQM-14, that's got the highest number of votes right now. If I scroll down a little bit, there's a couple of other little reporting widgets. And just here's a heat map that says, oh, there's a lot of things that get asked about the Slice Editor. So if I was a user wanting to ask for functionality in the Slice Editor, what we'd suggest to you is come here, find this, either here or down in here, uh, Tools and Docs Slice Editor. And let's just open that in a new tab. And that shows you all the issues that people have asked for in the Slice Editor. And let's say I want a, I want a feature where I can color by, uh, by the beam angle. So I type the word color in the search bar, and that isolates the cases with that. And I scan through, like, Color by beam receive angle. That sounds what like what I want. Yes, yes. And I read this. This is exactly what I want. And then I come over here and I click this button. I vote for the issue. And I could say, this would be helpful for me to troubleshoot installations. That helps us figure out how you might want to use that. And then it, then it also helps a little dialogue between other users. I click Add. And this goes into the comment history. And this is open to anybody that can log into JIRA. And there I'm done. So just to, to round that out, to make point out how easy that is, you log in. You come to this dashboard, which is where I am already. You find the, the tool that you want to ask about. You look at the cases about that tool. You search. You find the case that's relevant to you, if there is one, and then you, you vote on it. And you add a comment if you like, then you're done. The alternate is you create a new issue, and then you go through the usual process, and you have to provide a lot of information. You know, what's your dongle ID, or what's your operating system? You know, that takes a lot of time. And really, if you did a quick search, you might find that people have already gone through that work. So it saves you time, and it saves us time. So we can focus more on helping with questions and building software than we do with shepherding cases through a system. So taking a couple minutes to search in here saves everybody a lot of time. Uh, you're, you walk away happier as a user, and we walk away happier because we don't have to walk that case through from the first frontline support to the support product manager to the pro product manager just to get it here. So uh, it saves everyone a lot of time. We're pretty excited about this. We've been using it with Quincy now for a little bit. So if I come back to my PowerPoint here, where was I? Uh, one more comment here before I move on, actually. If, if the, on the top of any feedback case that you look at, there's a couple of links. There's our feedback policy. So it gives some text. You know, why are we doing this? What's the point of it? We explain how we want to be transparent. How do your suggestions become feedback items? And also, we want to be transparent. How do we choose feedback items for implementation? And we use a process. It's, it's described there. So we want that to be transparent. So you know, we encourage you to go read that. If it, it helps you understand how we work. Uh, and then also there's a little bit of a link here that, to that captures basically what I just demoed to you. If you're to make a feedback item or vote on it, you can comment, you can vote, and you can watch the issue. And that's important. If something's really important to you, if you click the watch button, you'll get a notice anytime somebody else votes or makes a comment. And that helps you understand if this is getting a lot of traction. So you can come in and have more conversations with people. And another side effect is you might be able to share workarounds. If this isn't implemented yet, you might be able to share workarounds that you're using to, to do what you want to do. So uh, we want to make the point that we really, really mean it with the feedback project. This is a, the accumulation of a few years of trying to figure out how to do this really well between two, two software uh, companies that really had you know pretty 
good ideas of how to do this before, but when you merge everything together, it gets a little hard to, to, to scale that up. So this is the outcome of that. We really mean this. Uh, we did this with a pilot project with Quincy. We've already delivered 25 feedback items in the past few releases. Uh, with the last release of Chimera just a couple of weeks ago, we already did two. So we, we intend to actually kick this off now, but we found two that were quite easy to do. And what we're willing to do is making a commitment to you right today in the webinar is we're going to scan the top 10 voted issues uh, and in time for Oceanology, which is March 13th, we're going to implement one of those in the next uh, maintenance release. So that would likely be Chimera 1.6.1. And then a further and bigger commitment we want to make in the webinar publicly here is that for the summer release, so coming later this year, maybe early fall, we're going to target 15 of the issues in the next uh, feature release. So 15 of the top issues that follow the, the selection guidelines that I pointed you to earlier. We're going to make a commitment to that. So if uh, we're getting close to the end here, if you're interested in the evaluation, we have a new licensing system, something you might have got an email about already. Uh, this allows us to do really neat things like just send you an activation code. You don't need to log in and type in your MAC address. We don't need to ship you a dongle. Uh, so if you're interested in having an evaluation, I got the green light from the sales team for this. Go to the webinar chat widget where you've been typing questions and just type the word eval. That tells us that you are interested in having an evaluation person. Uh, and please give us your company name too. If it's not immediately apparent from your email address, just let us know your company name and we'll input that into our system. And what we'll do in the next few days, we'll email you an activation code and a Chimera 1.6 download link in case you're not a customer yet. We'll just give you a link to download that. And then after you install it, you'd run the license manager from the Windows programs menu and it'll show up That's this uh, this dialogue here and if you click this button add activation code and you copy and paste that code that we send to you and you click OK and you'll get a time limited evaluation and so this really really streamlines this process and what we'll do is we'll have a record of your email address and we'll just follow up with you at a later time to see how you're doing uh, and just check up on you so take a moment now jump to the webinar chat log and type eval if you're interested uh, and even if you're an existing client uh, and you already have Chimera you probably don't have access to the new add-ons, the, the refraction correction and the ENC uh, features. Those are new add-ons. So if you want to try those out, please type eval right now. Of course, you can use the old way too and go to the website, but this is just a quick way for us to get a sense of interest and then we can get a big list of the sales team and they can uh, fan this out and get emails to you. And then lastly, we've got a bit of a surprise here. We're pulling a bit of a stunt we're going to offer a one-year sponsored license to two people. So we checked the download logs. Who was the first person to download Chimera 1.6? It was Garrett Mitchell. We're going to send you a one-year sponsored license. And then the first person to register for the webinar today was Paul Frazier. We're going to send you a one-year sponsored license for Chimera with all of the add-ons. We're going to be in touch with an activation code uh, shortly through email. Uh, so anyway, that's it. That's all we have for today. We'll take a couple of questions. Uh, to wrap up, and I think we're pretty much near the end of our hour. Yeah, there are, there are no further questions, actually, JB. There are a couple of requests for evaluations, though, so that's great. Okay, good. All right. Uh, we did launch a new licensing system. Maybe we may take a minute. If anybody has any questions about that, uh, we can maybe touch on those. Uh, it's, it's a complete uh, new way of licensing. If you're a Quincy user with a HASP dongle, you won't notice the difference. But if you are using uh, the blue dongles that you would have had with Flatermouse or uh, LIC files, you'll need to get in touch with the sales team to get your licensing changed over. So maybe I'll take a minute and answer any questions about that, why we did it, what's the intent, and then what new things can we do with that? Anybody? No? A couple of new uh, evaluation requests coming in. Wow, that's great. Someone saying okay. thanks, JB. Garrett Mitchell says thanks, JB. You're welcome. So what? No uh, we'll, question. Maybe we'll leave the webinar open just a little bit to give people to finish typing an eval in their company name. Uh, we'll just maybe leave, leave it open for another minute. But uh, what I'll do is I'll just leave this open here on the end screen, and I'll just shut off my mic. And then, Abelene, uh, you just give me a shout out when you see the eval uh, requests uh, dying down and we'll, we'll tear down the webinar. 
Okay, that's a good idea, JB, and I'll stop the recording anyway. So that's good. Thanks. Thanks All a right. lot. Thanks, everybody. Bye.